astronomical terms. And then if you actually zoom in, this is us. So you see that the noise, the background noise, is very high. But we have the first picture of an extrasolar planet, basically, of us as an extrasolar planet. 400 billion kilometers away, kilometers and miles, in that kind of scale, are roughly interchangeable. This is us. This is what we're looking for, even from much further away. I, well, yes, sorry, go ahead. The extrasolar noise, is yes. that uh, sound waves going through the... Basically, uh, what the noise is, is just, uh, it's, it's a lot of things, but what the biggest noise source right now is, as you know, in our system, we have a lot of dust still. And that dust is also reflecting the starlight. Not what we see here is the Earth reflecting sunlight because we look in the visible where we look. And all the dust that's still residual in the system <coughs> is also doing the same thing. So the dust is a very wide area that also reflects light back. And that's our major background source. So what you mean by noise is Oh, it's just it's other photons. signals. Yes, photons from, sorry, yes, thank you very much for the question. Yeah. Why is the Earth in the middle of, 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 of several oh. streaks? So the streaks are only the way that Voyager actually made the picture, because Voyager was not made for making a nice picture like that. So uh, they had the glare from the, from the sun coming in, and to avoid um, saturating the camera, the CCD, they basically made a trick that smeared some of the colors out. And so you see that for the different filters, you see streaks around the image. Nothing like that. We are not in streaks. It just looks that way because of the images. <laughs> so we all find no streaks going on right now. But basically, you have other signals that make it more difficult to actually find the small, small dot that you're looking for. Let's have a look at the thermal emission. Ooh. So it's kind of hot in here, right? No. So I'm telling you that you guys right now are much better targets than when you came in because <laughs> you're hotter. So if you're hot, you're getting more bright. And this, in terms of an extra solar planet, is a good thing. Uh, here you see our Earth, and this is our moon as uh, looked back from it from Mars. So the mission went to Mars had a look back and had a look at Earth in the infrared, where you only see the warmth. And the funny thing is, if I zoom in, this is Earth. It's not anything that's reflected. It's actually something that Earth emits because it's hot outside. So about right here would be summer up here. And this is, of course, the north or the south pole. So you see it's cold there. But just to give you a feeling that if we look in the visible, we look at reflected light. Sunlight's coming in, reflecting off differently from land, or from sea, or from trees. Well, if we look in the infrared, the only thing that's important is how hot this planet is. And here, honestly, global warming would be a good thing, <coughs> because it makes the planet brighter. It would be bad for us, but finding it is going to be easier. And this is just an interpretation of exactly that image. Do you see that at the pole it's cold? And here you have land masses where it's the hottest. That basically confers. And this is, if we go from this image, if I collect in a big bucket of light, that's my telescope, just the light from this planet, what I can do after that is I can split it up again. So I have all this white blob, and then I split it out in wavelengths. So this is from 5 to 25 microns because it's the infrared. But basically it's the same thing as saying, I have a look at the red end of the spectrum and the blue end of the spectrum, just in the thermal infrared. Is that kind of clear how you split up light? Mm -hmm. And the weird thing is, so you have a planet. <coughs> and this curve here tells you what temperature of the planet is, at least the emitting temperature. And the key thing, the really fun thing about this is these things are missing. You see, the curve is not beautiful. This is, if I had no atmosphere on this thing, this is what I should be seeing. But you see here, there's something missing. And I know if there's something missing here, I know that there's water. Here is something else missing. Ooh, 
I know that there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Here, if it's around nine microns, if there's something missing, I know that there's ozone, which tells me that there's an ozone, ozone layer in the atmosphere. So this is basically how we decipher a spectral fingerprint of a planet. If there's nothing, if it's just a flat curve, the planet has no atmosphere. If there's things missing, we actually see that there's something interesting. And just to give you a comparison, this is Earth, the blue line. And then you have Venus, where you only see carbon dioxide. And you have Mars, where you see carbon dioxide. And you see that Mars is actually much colder, because the line is down there. And then uh, I got a question another time in one of my talks. Somebody was like, so can you see if there's intelligent life? Well, like, again, yeah, you know, I don't even know how to define intelligent life. What we can tell is like, what about if we actually look for life like ours? That would be a good first step, right? And then we were saying, well, what about takeout? What about on this planet out there, there's also like really nice takeout shops like here. Chinese, Mexican, whatever you want. They probably give you too much stuff again, right? Mm -hmm. So you actually need a fridge. And we all know that what a fridge actually produces is freons, right? That's the thing that actually destroys our ozone layer. So this is why I was saying maybe not 100% intelligent life, because if you destroy your ozone layer, they probably haven't learned much more than we do. And so we had a look. And there is actually some features for a fridge on another planet. <coughs> But these features are really, really tiny. I'm not saying that we can see it, but with the first telescope that we're going to put up there that's going to be about three meters, it's going to be too tricky to see features that are that small. So we'll have to look. At first, we'll have to look for water, oxygen, and CO2. And then, if we go back, we'll kind of try to figure out whether they have takeout on that planet. <laughs> So this is basically what we're going to expect. You see the triple features? This is just translating into different sizes of telescopes. If the telescope is small, this is what we're going to get. Again, as I said, if it's a smooth line, there's no atmosphere. But here you see things missing, oxygen, CO2, water, water again. If you get a <coughs> bigger telescope, it's actually pretty funny what you can do. Because here in the CO2 line, again, you know that carbon dioxide is uh, one of the greenhouse gases we have. What you see is an inversion. Here you see that this is not a smooth line, but you see that there's a peak. And that peak actually tells you that we have a cold trap in our atmosphere, that we have an inversion <coughs> in the temperature structure. So even so, the spectral fingerprints don't have a great resolution. They can tell you a lot of interesting things about these planets. And now I just stole the slide of a colleague of mine. Uh, this is just to talk about the NASA budget, because I got a lot of questions recently about it. And he's the project scientist for this terrestrial planet finder project. What's an amazing project, trying to go out there and find these planets. But of course, with NASA's current going up and down and budget, it's kind of not such a safe bet. And so he, he likes this movie that's called uh, Shakespeare in Love. And he just returned it. He said, let me explain about the space business. The natural condition is one of unsurmountable obstacles on the road to imminent disaster. And so the executives say, like, well, so what do we do? And he just says nothing. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. We don't know how, but we basically work with the assumption that at one point, the budget is just going to go back at least to a certain stable state. <coughs> and he's just trying not to worry about it. I think NASA is making a lot of decisions. And <coughs> things like finding other planets, I think, is high on the list whether or not we're first going to want to go to the moon or not. 